When you're called on, we ask that you state your name and the organization that you are representing, at least the first time. And with that, I will send it over to Vince. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. People are still coming in, um, but I will pull up the PowerPoint. Now, our our plan was to to allow everyone to have access to this PowerPoint um, early on, so that way, let's see if this is successful. All right, can everyone see that PowerPoint? Yes. Good. Thank you. All right, Sean, is that that is that you? Is that you? Yes, sir. All right. Well, um, Chief of Staff and Deputy Commissioner Sean LaTourette would like to provide some opening remarks to kind of set us in the right direction, and then we will go through our PowerPoint. All right. Well, thank you for that, Vince. Uh, I'm not sure if, if if the PowerPoint is up or if or if I'm up and. <laughs> We could just should see I, you. Should I begin? We see you. Okay, good, because I see the PowerPoint. <laughs> so just wanted to make sure. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Vince, um, and thank you, uh, Lauren, uh, and and uh, to Katie Angarone, uh, for Associate Commissioner of Science and Policy uh, out of the Commissioner's Office, and to the entire uh, New Jersey Pact uh, regulatory team. Uh, this effort uh, has been. Uh, near and dear to so many of us uh, within the department, uh, and I know is of a top priority uh, to the governor and, and his team. As folks uh, will probably remember, uh, back uh, in early January, uh, which in a way feels like yesterday, in another way feels like six years ago, uh, given the special challenges of this particular year, um, Back in January, when the Energy Master Plan was unveiled, Governor Murphy signed Executive Order 100. Uh, at that point, I don't think any of us anticipated uh, we'd be well into uh, the uh, triple digits of executive uh, orders uh, by this time in the year. But, but despite uh, the challenges of the pandemic, uh, the team at DEP has been hard at work in developing regulatory proposals uh, to protect against climate threats. Uh, and we've pulled on some of the best resources uh, within this department uh, across all of our regulatory schemes. Uh, folks like Sue Lockwood, who is at the forefront of the Freshwater Wetlands Protection Act rules uh, when New Jersey first assumed that program uh, and remains uh, one of few states uh, to, to still fulfill that assumption. Uh, folks like Kim Springer uh, and her team uh, in coastal management uh, and folks <clears throat> across our division of land, uh, land resource uh, protection that, that Vinny will speak about uh, briefly uh, with respect to our reorganization efforts, uh, and none of which would be possible without Vinny's uh, stewardship, support from folks like Lauren, and I am just so grateful uh, that we've arrived at the place we have, a more protective place, a place where we are taking stock of the realities informed by the science and prepared to take steps to bring our regulation, our regulatory schemes, not just into the present, but into the future. You know, one of the things that I will, will often talk about, uh, and I'm always so happy to have Island Beach State Park uh, behind me, one of the, the two major gems of our state park system in New Jersey, uh, we face real risks, real, measurable, difficult risks from climate change. In some ways, New Jersey is ground zero for the worst impacts of climate change, giving our low-lying nature a vulnerability to, to things like sea level rise and chronic inundation, uh, that the rule framework we're here to talk about today uh, is meant to uh, begin addressing. By no means do we think that the framework that we'll present to you today is the end of the discussion. No, rather it is the beginning because we must take iterative steps 
over a course of years to best prepare ourselves for what is here and what is to come. So I often think of New Jersey Pact uh, as an enduring uh, regulatory adaptation effort that has multiple pieces. Uh, this piece that you'll hear about today, real environments and landscapes, or, or real, because climate change is real, uh, will, will itself have multiple parts, the first of which uh, you'll hear about today. Uh, and it's not just intended to facilitate uh, and better prepare us for the risks of climate change, but also to take stock of, of some of the things uh, that better protect our communities writ large through approaches uh, to land resource protection that are rooted in watershed management. And Vinny will talk a bit about that uh, today. Some of the reforms that you'll hear about aren't just specific to climate, but they're specific to interrelated uh, issues like the protection of riparian areas uh, and, and how we go about uh, having more complete alignment with the National Flood Insurance Program. But with respect to climate, our main driving force of this reform, what we know is this. By 2050, New Jersey is likely to experience two additional feet of sea level rise above, uh, <clears throat> above 2,000 levels. Now, that has potentially disastrous outcomes. And the rules we're looking at today with all of you and asking for your feedback on are to better protect us and better prepare us for that eventuality. It is not theoretical. It is real, it is happening and it is here. So how are we gonna rise to that moment? How are we gonna say, Let's use the best uh, science and integrate that into our rulemaking structure. Instead of looking at, uh, the, at surrogates that are inherently backward looking, how do we expect more of ourselves as regulators and more of each other as members of one New Jersey community? How are we gonna ensure that my children will get to enjoy this park the way I have? It's by not only looking at climate pollutant reduction, which uh, we held a session on yesterday and we'll have more meetings on to come, but how we say it's time to look at expanded flood hazard area jurisdiction. It's time. We know that the 100 year storm isn't really the 100 year storm. It's time for us to say, let's look at climate risk assessment and let's make sure that our decisions as a society are informed by the risks before us? And how do we begin building a path toward a future where we are not just offloading risk on some future property owner, on some future community? Now, we don't accomplish all of this in, in one swoop. Uh, like I said, it is iterative and it will take time, but the work begins now. And Vinny's gonna take you through it with the support of his fantastic team. And I thank all of you for being part of our stakeholdering thus far. There will be more engagement to come. Let's do this together. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much for that. All right, let's see. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Yes, we can see it. Okay, that is that was half the battle. I was making sure I had the right screen up. Okay, so thanks again, Sean. That was that was that was wonderful. Um, I'm I do feel privileged that I can work with such an amazing team and that we've had the time and have we're given the opportunity to take a hard look at our rules and see how we can not only adapt to climate change threats, but also to improve areas where there's disconnect, as, as Sean mentioned, especially from a watershed point of view. One of the things that um, I think that we've done a great job at, at at DEP over the years is having rules that focus well on the individual impacts to regulated resources on a site. And one thing that I think we've missed the mark on is being able to look uh, holistically at how the cumulative impacts that are occurring in a watershed or along a river system or in a, in a larger wetlands complex, what, what 
what impact that is having on water quality. And, and so uh, part of this, the very, very few slide, first few slides of the PowerPoint, I wanted to share with you some of our vision of how, how this reorganization that Sean spoke of will help to further these, these goals. All right. Um, hopefully everyone has had an opportunity to take a look at the PowerPoint that we made available on Friday evening. And so having a watershed based approach to land resource protection is is our is our main thrust at this point. And the, the purpose of that, as I mentioned, is so that we can take a broad holistic look at environmental protection rather than just a site by site incremental approach. So what this allows us to do is to look at each watershed as a unique resource and assess the impacts that are occurring in each watershed and and then to adapt the rules to to match our goals in that watershed so for example if a watershed has impaired waters that have been identified or if there's c1 waters that have been identified then perhaps there's a different approach to regulatory um, uh, rubric in that watershed so that we can further our water quality goals. Sean also mentioned that we have uh, some new vision and uh, new divisions. So the, the land use management program is now called the watershed and land management program uh, of which I'm the assistant commissioner and our division of land use regulation is now called the division of land resource protection because we felt that that better matched the vision that we have for uh, for what that what that division does, which is to protect wetlands, our coastal resources, our riverine systems, and our highlands. Um, and then we have a new division called the Division of Watershed Protection and Restoration. And so that that division will be uh, 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 side by side with the Division of Land Resource Protection in developing standards and monitoring and providing mitigation and and a number of many other important functions that are important, important pieces to this puzzle. So I don't want to spend too much time on the on the preamble because hopefully you've seen this before and many of you or all of you have been on uh, the call in the past and I, I'm very happy that we have an opportunity to talk again a little more specifically about the thoughts that we have about how we're uh, planning to address climate change threats. But I do think it's always good to remind ourselves of what the objective is of this rulemaking. And very simply put, it's to address the unavoidable impacts of climate change, such as sea level rise, extreme weather, and chronic flooding through targeted regulatory reforms that will modernize the land use rules and focus on increased resiliency throughout the state. There are many economic benefits um, to, to resiliency, and there's economic impacts related to flooding and climate change uh, that we hope to avoid by this rulemaking so that people are able to make good decisions. And so our guiding principles here, not only do we want to develop regulatory standards that are commensurate with the risk of, of uh, that we anticipate in a given area, but we want to provide tools wherever we can to, to uh, folks making decisions out there about what kind of development or redevelopment activities are occurring so that they can make informed decisions, so that they can make good choices not just for today, but for whoever eventually inherits that property and inherits their decisions. Um, we're, we're all living with the decisions that were made in the past decades, um, development patterns, um, and and uh, it's it's this is an opportunity for us to revisit that and to turn back the clock where we can on on our our uh, in, in so that we can reclaim some of our water quality benefits that have been lost. Obviously, we need to public uh, public health and safety needs to be protected. We, of course, want to ensure that our, our rules reflect current science uh, and consider future conditions as informed by that science. We want to encourage development that's reason redevelopment that's safe, sustainable, resilient, and that wherever possible reduces the risk from and contribution to climate change. And we want to facilitate in any way we can the creation and restoration of natural systems that will assist in the mitigation of climate threats. So this plays out in, in eight major themes. And if you look at the agenda, we have time set aside for each one of them. Um, we will probably focus our most amount of time on the first one because it talks most, we talk mostly about how the floodplain is changing and that's where a lot of everything else is kind of plugged into it. Um, but I would like to do less talking and more listening. So I'll set this up and then I, I invite you to, to speak uh, to your concerns and your thoughts and your ideas related to this. 
So in the past, we've talked about how our approach to inundation and flood damage has three main thrusts. First is to establish a regulatory area called the inundation risk zone, and that would account for land that will be inundated by sea level rise over, over time, whether twice a day or permanently. The second is to redefine what our tidal flood hazard area looks like to account for that, that expansion due to sea level rise. As sea levels rise, then the attendant tidal flood elevation will also rise by at least that much. And so that needs to be accounted for. And then in our riverine systems, while that's not necessarily affected uh, directly by sea level rise, maybe the lower portions of a, of a riverine system would, but uh, there, there's increased precipitation that is likely to occur. A warmer atmosphere can hold more water and more water in the atmosphere means more intense rains, means more frequent rainstorms. And so there's some predictions that we have about the increase in runoff. I think everyone here is familiar with this table. I, I place it here um, mostly as a conversation starter and to kind of remind folks that, that we are focusing on the year 2100 for this regulatory uh, rubric that we're creating and for the purpose of discussion, assuming moderate emission levels. And one of the things that we've we originally contemplated was to say, well, let's 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 focus on 3.3 feet of sea level rise because that has a 50% chance of happening. But that also means that there's a 50% chance that it will be more than 3.3 feet. So if we were to incorporate 3.3 feet into our rules and encourage people and promote people to de to develop to raise their buildings to that amount or to develop new developments at that increased level. What we're really saying is that there's a 50% chance that that will not work, that it won't be enough. And so that's not good odds. And so what we've been focusing on is what we call the 17% chance, which means that there's a seven, there's only a 17% chance that sea level will, sea level rise will increase by more than 5.1 feet. So that becomes the target for our discussion of the inundation risk zone and also for the floodplain in the tidal zones. You've also probably seen this slide. It shows a cross section of, of the coastline and then a plan view at the top. Um, so this depicts the different levels of risk, right? Zone one is the current inundation area. So that's bounded by the current shoreline. Zone two is this inundation risk zone that we've been speaking of. And that's the area that will be inundated either twice a day or permanently because of the advance of, of the shoreline due to sea level rise. And then the same dynamic happens in the floodplain. You have the current flood hazard area and then the, the future flood hazard area. So why this is so important is that this home, for example, is depicted as being outside the current flood hazard area. And so this person probably doesn't have flood insurance. And we all know that flood insurance is only required if your banks require it because you have a mortgage. So there are people that paid off their homes and have dropped their flood insurance. And um, a lot of people were severely impacted during Hurricane Sandy because the flood didn't know it was supposed to stop at that line on the map and people were, were impacted who didn't think they would be. So let's talk a little bit about this inundation risk zone. So this is dry land. We have, we have a comment in the chat. Oh, yes, please. Thank you. Natalie Snyder asked, how are you thinking about episodic low frequency events, AKA the thousand year storm hurricanes in addition to sea level rise? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, we're going to speak a little bit of that to uh, to how we develop the floodplain delineations. But, um, you know, our our uh, our focus is on what the hundred year flood is in the future, right? The hundred year flood plus a factor of safety and fluvial areas and what that would look like in the future with future climate projections. Um, so you'll see how we are are incorporating the existing mapping resources that we have um, and the options that we're that we're considering. Uh, in that regard. So the inundation risk zone is not an insignificant portion of New Jersey. The, the map on the, on the right shows you an estimate of the area that would be inundated by sea level rise of five feet. So these, this is land. This was created by a GIS layer that shows land within five feet of the mean high or high water line vertically. And most of the, the structure of the flood hazard rule has been and, and it's successful in this regard has been to say, if you can, if you can, uh, you, you have two options, rely on the mapping that's available with perhaps factors of, of safety added or considerations there, or have an opportunity to calculate it yourself. So if 
if the mapping tools that are available, such as njfloodmapper.org, uh, which if you haven't gone to, you should you should go there and play around with it. It's it's scary to see what will happen along the coast with even one or two feet of sea level rise, much less five. And you can you can uh, determine what portion of the site would lie within this inundation risk zone right from that map. But if you have more site specific data on the elevation of the mean high high or high water line, then you can calculate it yourself. Is the thinking? Hey, so Vince. Uh, yes. Sorry. We have a question from Ray Cantor. Hi, Ray. Hey, Billy. Uh, first of all, I don't see a chat function here, so I can't send anything in, into chat. I'm not sure why. I don't have it on this map. Uh, just a, a quick comment and, and then a couple quick questions, if I can. Um, and I know Sean started off by saying this is um, not theoretical, it's real, but I'll just make a general comment that projecting out to 2100 is not as real as um, you know, uh, everyone says it is, but we'll have more comments about that later. But, but the, the two questions is, are um, you're setting up inundation zones, but yet we have not seen DEP's resiliency report. You know, um, for, if there is a wall around Hoboken, then uh, the inundation zone is not there. You know, it's protected by a shore protection um, system. So how are the regulations going to take in, that into account? And also, you know, you're showing these maps right now. Are we going to have, uh, does the public have access to these maps? And do you have any data that shows how much additional area is being added into the flood hazard area jurisdiction, town by town? Not town by town. So, so first of all, thank you, Ray. Thank you for bringing up those points. Um, a few things. One is that this, yes, this tool that you're seeing right now, this map, this is Atlantic City, and this shows what, what it would look like with five feet of sea level rise, right? So anything that's blue or, or light blue or white would be inundated. Um, and this is available to the public. It's njfloodmapper.org. Uh, and so you can I invite everyone to take a look at their communities and see how climate change might impact. And uh, as far as the, the extent of the IRZ and how development would interact with that, you're right. If, if water is prevented from getting into an area, if there's a seawall around Hoboken, then, then that will be a consideration as to where the inundation risk zone is. The, the, the thinking is not to be um, prohibitive in this, but to be, to be intelligent about how, does, how, how development or redevelopment activities happen. Um, we recognize that people need a place to live and work, but we also don't want to encourage investment in an area that we have has a high likelihood of being inundated in the future because that means future costs if someone builds a home in an area that's going to be underwater in 30 40 50 years then who's paying for that most most of us are probably paying for that some way through flood insurance costs or or other uh, functions so there's there's a great number of societal costs that are associated with that that spread across um, we do have i don't recall off the top of my head what the numbers are uh, but we will we'll be looking at the you know percentages of the state let's say that lie within this inundation risk zone is mapped and we have estimated what uh, what an increase in the tidal flood elevation would do to that to that same area fema had had uh, a few years back estimated that 35 percent of new jersey lies within a flood hazard area and i'm thinking that it it'll be more like 40 or 45 percent with the increases but we need to get some of those numbers uh figured out and publicly available. We don't have breakdowns by town, though. Uh, so thankfully, I'll just leave with, with one last comment. Um, I understand what you're doing, and, and we'll talk specifics later on as well. But you know, as you know as well, New Jersey is a very highly developed state. And I'm assuming much of the area which is going to be in inundation zones are already significantly developed. So you know, I just wonder how much much we're preventing and how much we're, we're actually doing through the rules, given, you know, the extensive development we already have. And I'll, uh, you don't have to respond. I'll just leave it with that. All right. Thank you, Ray. And and I would just also like to um, uh, invite, um, since there's so many people on the call, if uh, if you would, just for the benefit of others, if you would just uh, rep explain who whom you represent, if you're representing yourself or if you're part of an organization that will give some context. Sorry, uh, Ray Cantor, NJBIA, just uh, for, for those of you who don't know. Thanks, Ray. 
Appreciate it. And Vince, there are just a couple more comments in the chat. OK. Dave Pringle said, it's good that you're planning for five feet in 2100. Looking forward to hearing that the rules are protective enough of that risk. Dave Pringle, Clean Water Action. David Hosjack, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, using the 100 year flood term is misleading. Why not use the 1% annual chance instead? You're absolutely right. And that is something that we're addressing in the rule because um, because that is it is unfortunate terminology. I had a lot of conversations with people over the years telling them that they were in a 100 year floodplain and the last flood was 20 years ago, so that they thought that meant the next flood was going to be 80 years from now, and it obviously doesn't work that way. So, it is better to speak of it as probability. Um, my, uh, my, it's it's old. Uh, what is it? You can't. It's it's hard to break old habits. So, one percent flood. That's where we'll go from here on. Okay, Vince, so and we have two people with their hands raised. We have uh, Scott Minich. Hey, Scott. Hey, Vince. Um, Scott Minnick with Dewberry. Um, the flood mapper tool as it exists now, and I know you have to start somewhere, is they take the the mean low water plus five or mean high water plus five feet and they project it inland. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just on an expert panel with Rutgers and other um, constituents, and they were saying that the projection of that elevation can cause, you know, almost an over... Um, an over exaggerated area because that that water level will actually lower as you move further inland and it can be an increase of up to 75 60 to 75 percent of an areas that wouldn't necessarily be in it i know you have to start somewhere but i'm just wondering that we would have enough in the rules that as that science um and those projections can be more kind of um looked at and, and edited in the flood mapper tool by Rutgers, which they are looking at doing um, that the rules would kind of allow for that. So even though we're saying an area is in it now, it may not necessarily be in it later and that the rules have that flexibility. That's all. Okay. Uh, Vince, I think you're muted. Am I back? Yes. I don't know what I did. OK, let's try this. You can still see the PowerPoint, right? Yes. OK, good. OK, um, to my to my earlier point, um, uh, Scott, so thank you. The 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 rubric that seems to work well in our in our in the flood hazard arena is to say there there's mapping available of various sorts, right? There's the one percent mapping. There's their design flood mapping on the state level. There's now inundation risk zone mapping that's available that we showed, but there's always an opportunity to have more site specific uh, focused data on that site. So that's that's definitely something that we'll consider. And we have uh, Grant Lucking next. Hey, Grant. Hi, Vince, how are you? Good, sir. Uh, quick question on what we could do, maybe not a quick answer, not sure. What, what can we do to address future changes in these rules today for instance if sea level rise looks to be getting worse or maybe it's not as bad and then how to reflect updates to the surrogates that we do use for instance the north uh, north atlantic or north american vertical datum is going to be updated in 25 and i think people are already expecting that it's going to reflect a 0.5 to one foot rise in um sea level so how can we incorporate things like that to make sure that the rules reflect those changes as time moves on yeah that's a really great point grant and and it kind of illustrates the the balance that we have to achieve because on one hand we we need rules that are predictable and are, are based on what we have now but um there needs to be an acknowledgement that that as as additional data comes in that we can course correct um so so that is definitely something that is important to us that we're considering. OK, Vince, we've got one more before you move on. It's uh, Tony McDonald. Uh, thank you. If you can hear me, um, I'm, I'm the director of the Urban Coast Institute. I'm actually uh, passing on this comment question on uh, uh, Tom Harrington, who's the associate director and actually a coastal engineer, um, has is looking at it a little bit more closely. Uh, but he's uh, he raised a little bit of a concern that maybe the five foot um, added to the flood mapper is a bit of an oversimplification. Um, 
given um, the, what goes into the flood mapper itself, and it would sort of be bathtubbing the uh, the kind of increment when um, some of the modeling actually could take into account um, shoreline structures and bulkheads um, to more accurately refer that. I think there's a little bit of a, a challenge moving from the flood mapper, which is you know sort of more of a planning framework to a management framework. And he thinks that might also be even more complicated in the context of the tidal flood hazard area. So um, we're a little bit concerned that that, that five feet is uh, oversimplifies it um, relative to um, the other kind of actual conditions uh, on the ground. It might lead to some uncertainty. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Um, that's that, it sounds like we we will focus our conversation on that regard because the the what we didn't want to have happen is that if we didn't have a starting place for the inundation risk zone, then that would back everyone into the corner of having to figure it out for themselves, right? And and that could be costly and time consuming. And so if you're outside the inundation risk zone and the mapping, then then you're fine, is the thinking. If you're in it and and you're okay with that, because depending on what you're doing, it might not affect you very much or it might affect you greatly. So there's always that option to right. look at look at it more specifically. But but yeah, that's that's great. I think we need to have uh, further conversations about the the appropriate use of this tool and the limitations and and benefits of it. Thank you. All right. So oh, let me go back to that. So we have you know, a lot of material here and hopefully you've been able to digest some of the material um, over the weekend and yesterday. Uh, so less talking on my end, more listening. Here's our, our thinking for how we would address buildings in an inundation risk zone. So are there any thoughts that anyone has on this on this slide? We have a question from Stephen Mori. Hi, Stephen. Stephen, we can't hear you. You might be muted. Hi, Vince. Steve Mori with Mott McDonald. How are you? Good, Steve. Um, question is, what is the owner certified climate risk assessment? Is that a is that a is that going to be a difficult thing for homeowners? Is that is that going to be applied in in all cases? So, the thinking is that the the information that would be first of all, it's a great question, and the the thinking on our part is that the information that we'd be asking would we commensurate with the risk level. So in inundation risk zone, what we mainly want to do is ensure that people that are planning to to do activities in this area that they've certified that they understand the climate risks and and perhaps include some data along with that. We 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 think what will happen is that by establishing this inundation risk zone um, that and and by placing it, if you see underneath that, it says a deed notice required. So let's say that we issue a permit or we issue a verification and we identify the inundation risk zone on a site that 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 will become part of the record as as this is an area, this this land is an area that the state of New Jersey has determined has a high risk of inundation and and therefore has certain safety considerations along with it. So mostly it's an acknowledgement of that um, if if it's um, something where there's a public public expenditure of funds or there's there's a, a you know threshold for types of developments then i think it's appropriate to have something more detailed maybe kind of an, an analysis rather than just a, a statement per se so the short answer is that it would be it would be tailored to the to the risk level and the type of development okay we have another question from georgia marino hey georgia Georgia, you're on mute. Um, the substantial improvement for residential buildings, um, you know, there's such a variety of residential buildings in the flood zone where you have some smaller, less, ex less pricey uh, homes that would sort of impact people wanting to do any kind of improvements to their homes or even fix something that would then be required to raise their homes to that elevation. Mm. Is there any thought on, you know, that in some of the highly developed 
city areas? Well, that's a great question, Georgia, and and it kind of gets to to the heart of of really what we wrestle with today in the flood hazard rule. If if someone is making an improvement to a home or a building, and the improvement does not rise to the level of a substantial improvement, then then there's no obligation for the rest of the building to be changed in any way, right? The the new development we would want to see to the maximum extent practicable to, sure. to meet the current rules, right? Once you hit that threshold of substantial improvement, then then our our position has been that such a substantial investment is being made here that we now have an opportunity to make the building more resilient, make it safer. And what's interesting is that even something like uh, flood insurance costs, uh, a few years back we did a, a kind of an internal analysis on on the flood insurance costs of a say a two hundred thousand dollar home. Um, based on whether they're one foot above, one foot below, two feet above, three feet above. And our, no matter how we crunch the numbers, it always came out that for, for every foot you go up, that there's a cost associated with it, but there's savings, a long-term savings, and that the costs of going up three feet are recouped within four to six years in most cases, be just because of, of reduced flood insurance rates. So, by by encouraging people to elevate and requiring it when it's when a substantial improvement, we're doing our best to try to help people help themselves in the long term, and then and then whoever they sell the home to has a has a more resilient, safer home. Certainly. But yeah, this wouldn't impact you know repairing things or you know replacing your roof or you know just normal property maintenance. Um, this would be new buildings, you know, substantially damaged and um, improved buildings, things like that. Okay, we have uh, Steve Dalton next. Hey, Steve. Hi, Vince. Um, I, I, I just had a question about, will you switch the slide on me? Oh, okay. I can go <laughs> back, I sorry. But I, there you, no, there you but go. You sir, I, I have a copy of the PowerPoint. I so put that, it back. That, that, that's fine. So the, the new, new build, you, you have this bullet that new buildings require a hardship exception and I, I just was wondering what would constitute a new building if that was you know would include redevelopment you know demo and knockdown of an existing building and construction of new and I guess as part of that I was also thinking about the hardship angle and whether the criteria for a hardship and I think some folks have some comments in the chat on the same issue, what the criteria would be and whether they would be criteria that could be reasonably achieved, um, or rather would they be like the, the flood hazard rule criteria that are, um, as I understand it, deliberately um, difficult um, to achieve? Those are, those are great questions, Steve. Um, so it's so your first question about redevelopment. So if, if a building is being knocked down completely and something brand new of a different sort is being built, then then um, it would that would require a hardship exception, just like a new building would. Um, and the context of the hardship is is along the lines of there's there's inherent risk in, in building in this area. And are there any other options that are available to you that would ameliorate that risk? Um, and is there any other reasonable use for this site that would ameliorate that risk? And so it's all it's the conversations that we've historically had where, for example, let's say someone was were, were to propose a multi-residence building that required um, dry access during a flood. And if there's, you know, based on the, the zoning and, and the, the market, if you could put a commercial building there instead of a residential building, then the dry access requirement goes away so is there a way to avoid that 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 risk assumption of of placing people in an area that could put could put them in harm so that's the kind of conversation that we would have under the context of a hardship exception recognizing that you know there needs to be a reasonable use of a property and um you know people own property for 40 years and have have expectations on that so so we're trying to balance that Okay, and just a reminder to everyone, um, before you ask your question, can you please um, announce your affiliation? Uh, we have uh, Valerie Crable up next. Hello, Hi, Val. 
Hi, Val Rabel, uh, Greenman Peterson. Um, I have a question. The, who pays the differential in cost for raising buildings if you have to raise a building an extra five feet over what FEMA would require based on their flood maps when you reconstruct? So right you mean now, like, like in the context right, of insurance, you mean? Right. The community, the codes and community standards portion of a flood policy and NFHIP flood policy mm -hmm. has an allowance of like thirty thousand dollars to raise your raise your property to above whatever the community standard is. That doesn't go that got, doesn't go very far if you're going to add another five feet on top of that. Absolutely. There has to be consistent. There has to be consistency between between what FEMA wants and what you want. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I invite anyone who knows more about this topic than I, because I, I won't pretend to be an insurance expert uh, to weigh in. But our experience after Hurricane Sandy was when we adopted the advisory flood maps and, and said your option is to use the, the higher of the effective or advisory flood map or calculate it yourself, that that because that became the regulatory standard for the community, which would be the state of New Jersey, that that the insurance would pay to have the building elevated to that amount, not just the FEMA minimum, but to what the community, our community of New Jersey would require in that case. Um, I think that would be the same like if there was a community that had, you know, a three foot of freeboard in their their floodplain ordinance, the my, my understanding is that the insurance would pay to have it meet current code. And then that's what that would that's what so um, if if we adopt these this five foot of rise in the tidal floodplain and and reconstructed buildings need to be elevated five feet higher than if it's damaged and it's an insurance matter my understanding is that it would be covered so let me get this straight so if somebody wants to build in an it or has a home in an inundation risk zone and they're going they've got i'm just trying to figure out how if a building right now is not in a fema mapped flood zone and it be, now it becomes a DEP map flood zone, how does one obtain FEMA insurance for a property that's not within a FEMA flood zone? So you can, you can ob obtain flood insurance if you're outside the flood zone. Um, I've convinced my family members who are just outside the flood zone to get flood insurance and it's, I think it's like $34 a month or something is what they pay. So you can, and I, I don't remember the statistic, but there, there are a relatively high number of folks in New Jersey that had flood damage um, and and payouts outside the the mapped floodplain. So you you can you can obtain insurance outside of that. Okay. Okay, and Vince, one more um, before you move on. Uh, Grant Lucking. Hi, Grant. Hi, Ben. Grant Lucking, NJBA. Just wanted to make sure the department had double triple checked that you know height restrictions in different localities or across different rulemaking schemes might be waived if uh, for any case where buildings need to be raised and elevated? Yes, that, that is something that we've been discussing. And I know there's some language in the Flood Hazard Area Control Act that was placed there after Hurricane Sandy. Um, but uh, we need to work with DCA also uh, to make sure that, um, you know, I think I think your point is that if we make everybody raise their, their structure five feet, um, if it's a new building or a reconstructed building, then does that mean they're losing a floor if it's a multi, you know, multi residence building, let's say. Um, so, yeah, we need to work that out. Correct. Appreciate it. All right, let's transition to roads. Um, I, I know that we could we could be uh, we could we could spend an hour on each slide because there's so much to talk about and I really appreciate the robust conversation, um, but as, as Sean mentioned, this is not your only opportunity, right? We're not only we're going to have opportunities to reconvene in a, in a public forum, but you can send your comments and concerns directly to us at the end of the presentation there. There's a power, there's a email address and, and there's a, um, uh, a website that you can submit comments to. Um, if so let, I, if I could just follow up on that really quickly, just because we're having such a robust discussion, we're not going to be able to get to the chat questions right now. We're going to hold them to the end and see what we can get to. So I just didn't want anybody to think we were ignoring you. Yes, I, I want to make sure that um, that we get through each of the slides so that we have an opportunity to talk about each thing. But then um, to the extent that we can, we'll we'll focus on on the chat. 
All right. So the way this plays out in roadways, and and I realize that I didn't explain what the climate adjusted flood elevation is, but the next few slides will explain what that means. The 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 cafe, as it were. Um, so that is the new flood elevation that we would be using across the state, but it's defined differently in tidal areas and fluvial areas. But first, let's speak of the inundation risk zone. Um, so we talked about buildings. Here's how we would handle roadways, right? There's some certain, certain activities that would be exempt, like repairs, um, where where there's an investment of of public money and there's and the project is a major development, then um, then there's an opportunity then to to we think to explore looking into how we can make the roadway more more resilient, and you know even even raising the road six inches or twelve inches might might bias another ten or twenty years of that road being able to service people or it's if it's overtopped by uh, a foot and you know it only be up overtopped by a few inches so again it's it's being it's being mindful of the risk and doing everything that we can as a community to try to ameliorate that risk now if it's a new road or it's a full depth reconstruction um, and it's a public roadway there needs to be a demonstration that there's a compelling public need for the project and obviously if it's a public entity that's proposing it that that goes that that speaks to that right because um we're going to assume the dot um, or uh, the transit authority or whatnot is not is not undertaking an activity unless there is a compelling public need um, but we do we do want to have a discussion about the expenditure of public funds in these areas and if it's a public if it's a private roadway uh, then and and again this is in the narrow context of that inundation risk zone we want everything to we want to do everything that can be done to make sure that that road uh, is is elevated to the extent it can be and that it it is only being built to serve an area that's otherwise developable and that can't otherwise be accessed. Uh, Vince, we have a comment uh, from Sandy Blick. Hi, Sandy. Hey, hey, Vinny. So I just have a question. On your slide, you talk about roads. Can you talk a little bit about work within the roadway, like um, when a utility company comes and does reconstruction on the road? Because you talked about something being a major development um, and I don't know if this is the time to ask that but I figured I would so in other words if someone were say putting cutting a trench down a row putting utility line and putting it back the way that it was right that's correct right so that's not something that would be initiated by by the DOT or the or whoever owns the roadway it's it's something that's it's being initiated by the utility company so I wouldn't think that there would be an opportunity to improve the roadway in any way in that case and so this should not come into play this is this would come into play in cases where there's a new road going in or there's full depth reconstruction and and so there's an opportunity in some cases maybe many cases to to make the roadway more safe all right i'm going to just keep advancing through the slides to make sure that we have time to talk about each issue but um, but, you know, we do want to get to uh, all of your comments because I can see in the chat that there are a number of them. So bridges and culverts, again, this is in the narrow context of an addition risk zone. If it's a simple structural repair or bridge deck replacement, um, then we want to have the conversation about whether, whether there can be um, any improvements to combat climate change. But we recognize that there probably is nothing that can be done or, or maybe likely can nothing be done but if it's a replacement then we would ask for a, either a general permit or individual permit depending on the scope of work and again just like a roadway if there's a substantial investment of funds in in building something or rebuilding something that will likely be there in 75 years then we think it's good to have that conversation about how it could be made to to be safer for the traveling public If it's a modification of the shape, size, or length, uh, then again, you know, and then get to getting into new structure. In all cases, we want to have that conversation. Um, public funds are 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 expenditure of public funds. We we think should be discouraged in these areas because again, this is an area that we we have uh, a, we have much science saying that in a 
in, in the lifetime of not us, but our children, that this will be underwater and then therefore lost. So, so having that conversation is important. Hey, Vinny, this is Scott Minnick with Dewberry. Hey, Scott. On, on that same, uh, that same vein, if a municipality or a DOT or a turnpike would have a plan in place um, using a risk-based assessment on you know, the criticality and vulnerability of their assets, um, would that be something that, uh, and they're looking at it more holistically and they would apply that to certain projects, is that something that DEP would look at and say, okay, you have, you, you know, we work with uh, DEP to, to incorporate this plan, but then once we apply it, they, when we would submit, that would be something we could kind of hang our hat on and say, we have a holistic approach, this is how this project in and of itself fits into the overall system, um, and that we're not going to do resiliency because we've built it in somewhere else, or vice versa. Yeah, that is that is wonderful. That that's that's exactly the the thinking that we have is that is that let's take a step back and look at what how how what we're doing here on this particular project fits in with the community's needs and the overall goals of the of the person or the entity that's the undertaking the work, um, the people that are being served by it, how vulnerable it is. So having a holistic plan in place is exactly what we're hoping to see happen. For, for 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 regulatory agencies and and uh, uh, the you know DOT insurance transit whatnot. Uh, Sarah Miller has a comment. Hi Sarah. Hi Vince. Um, Sarah Miller, Remington and Vernick Engineers. Um, what is uh, the department thinking about the level of um, analysis that's going to be required to to show one way or the other whether or not something can be done to make an additional improvement if a municipality who uh, typically is very concerned with what the cost is going to be apparent uh, or especially if they think it's a very simple repair to be done mm -hmm. you know and then it, you know they get hit with well it's going to cost you x number of dollars to do this analysis to prove that yes you just you are allowed to just replace it in kind mm. So, so that's a great question, and I and and my my vision for that would be that it would be a, more of a narrative. It would be more of a conversation that we would have. So, for example, on this map that you see here, which I believe this is a screenshot from from uh, from oh, now I know why Marilyn likes this slide because <laughs> I think Marilyn's home is on this slide somewhere. I like this. This is a good illustration of of uh, the V zone and the AE zone and whatnot. Um, so. So let's say that uh, the road was where it says zone AE elevation seven. OK, so uh, on this slide, we talk about how the climate adjusted flood elevation would be five feet higher than that. It's elevation 12. So we all know that that road can't be elevated to elevation 12. Um, that's that's not that's not hard to prove, right? No, no analysis needed there. However, it can perhaps be raised somewhat. And that's going to be bound by all the driveways that go into it, all the drainage drainage patterns of the area. So it may be that it's almost self-evident that very little can be done on on some of these smaller roadways that that are in you know in highly developed areas. Um, but but we want to at least have that discussion. We want to have that narrative. And so the rules would 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 spell out the types of things that we would ask someone to consider and explain to us. Understood. I'm just concerned for areas where we're not mapped. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's again something as simple as a uh, a single culvert replacement. I I'm concerned about that turning into this enormous analysis for something very simple that the, um, you know, the, the, the municipality would maybe not be willing to pay to analyze this particular structure or bridge or or culvert or not have the ability to pay um and then that improvement is left undone which to me is a worse scenario than just simply replacing it the way it is right right exactly so so we're what we're trying to do um is add value where we can and not not to burden communities right but but to provide tools and and means by which if improvements can be made then they should be made if they can't be made then they can't be made so again not not intended to be um a burden and and 
the thinking too, of course, is that there's long-term economic impacts associated with with a rising sea level and climate change. And so the more resilient a road is to uh, and 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 resistant a roadway, let's say, is to to periodic flooding or increased flood elevations, the more long-term savings there's going to be. Because if a road is continually overtopped, then that that means it's being repaired multiple times. There's you know investments of money in, in something that's that that is failing, but um, in the long term, we believe that it'll be more costly than to make better choices now, spend the money now where it can be, where some improvement can be made, and then there'll be a long-term savings. That's really the thrust of why we're doing this. I mean, even Moody's reaction, I, I don't know if, if you're aware of this, but um, they our announcement of, uh, of, our, of our NJ Pact initiatives was, um, I think it was credit positive was the term that they used. So... You know, it all kind of speaks to the long-term economic viability of a community. But your your point is well taken. We don't want to burden communities. We want to help them. Okay, Thanks, Vince. We have uh, two more questions before you move on. We have Joe Scoopy in first. Okay. Hey, Joe. Joe, perhaps you're muted. I, I can't hear you. I'm afraid still can't hear you, Joe. All right, um, why don't we take uh, Valerie Rabel next while we wait for Joe. Hey Vince, um, can you explain the, the, the correlation between the Rutgers mapping and this 100 year plus five? Because the, the Rutgers mapping is based on mean high or high water plus mm -hmm. the five feet, and there's no direct correlation between the tidal flood elevations, which are often tied to mean sea level, not NAVD 88 or NGVD 29. So why are we just adding five feet to the 100 year and not adjusting it for sea level? Mm -hmm. So there, there, that's, that's a great question. So a couple, a couple of things in there. One is that, um, is that an increase in, in sea level of five feet, no matter what the datum is, um, should, should cause a, a rise in the flood elevation by at least that much. It's, it's, possible that it could be more than that because there's more energy in the system right you know national academy of sciences i think estimated that in a given system that the maximum wave height uh was something like five per 55 percent of the depth of the water so if you have three feet of water versus eight feet of water then that means the the uh attendant wave on top of the still water elevation could be even that much higher but absent recalculating the flood zone along the entire coast we wouldn't we wouldn't know that um, so, again, there's always this option to say, if you can use the mapping plus the factor safety that we're adding into it, um, and you can design to that, then you're good. If you if you have better data that you can provide to us, as long as long as the final answer is not less than the um, uh, NFIP minimum standards for that community, then there's 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 an opportunity there. So for example, let's say you're building something in that zone AE where it's elevation seven. And we say, okay, you got, it's 12. That's what the climate adjusted flood elevation is. And you give us calculations to show us that it's 9.5 or 10.2 or whatever. Then, then that's what your design would be for that site. Okay. And is FEMA going to do any remapping taking into account all this stuff? Or this I haven't. Is, this is just New Jersey and not like up and down the East Coast. Um, I, I couldn't speak to what FEMA's plans are outside of New Jersey, but you know we have been working with them on on uh, on making sure that we're as resilient as possible. And so they they they've, under the NFIP they've been very supportive of us of having higher standards for community for the community. So, but I don't know about any remapping efforts that would take place. I think NOAA and Army Corps, along with FEMA, are doing that analysis now along the East Coast. Mm. All right, Joe Scoopian. Hey, yeah. Joe. Vinny, can you hear me now? I can, sir. How are you? Oh, great. All right, your luck just ran out. Um, <laughs> um, Vinny, the, I'm, I'm not a tidal flood expert, but simply taking the sea 
the mean sea level rise expected of five feet and adding that to a flood level just doesn't how much how much did you look at what is that based on how much research how much analysis it, it just doesn't taste right it, none of this is linear there's a fixed volume of water that can move on shore um, in, in, in any tidal flood event, the, the energy grade decreases as you go inland. Um, look, at the, look at the difference in tidal floods between Beach Haven and Manahawkin. Um, I, can't, I, don't, I just don't know if you can, and maybe you guys have looked at this in more detail, but starting at a higher base, starting at a higher water surface with the same tidal event, I don't see how that can, if I start five feet higher, my water level is going to be five feet higher. I've got more volumes of storage. I don't know. It just doesn't sound right. And that's a lot. That's a big number. It is a big, it is a big number. And, and definitely happy to continue having a conversation with you on this because, um, because um, we're open to any and all ideas in this regard. Um, we did do research on it and, you know, kind of assuming a bathtub model approach. You know, if your starting water surface elevation is five feet higher and there's that much more water in the system, you know, it is effectively and it's effectively on the ocean, an infinite volume of water. So, you know, our experience is that it's not particularly affected by by uh, flood storage like a fluvial system. Fluvial system obviously is completely different. Um, but, you know, the the our experience is that whatever the flood elevation is, that land that lies under it is inundated. And as as flood elevations go up, then that just means more land is inundated. Um, so, but yeah, let's let's have that conversation. Um, yeah, you know, I, 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 be, this seems to be something that could easily be modeled. I mean, when they do run the tidal models, they start with a starting water surface. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, so, it can certainly be modeled. But again, what we want to do is we want to be careful to to not force every person who wants to do anything to have to recalculate the floodplain along the ocean. Right. No, that's so that's why, why we always tr we always try to give people the option to say, well, if you can you if 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 you can use the mapping and with this factor safety, you know, we feel that that's protective um, for the long term costs. And and if you want to give us some better data, that's that's fine, too. Right. Well, no one's going to give you better data on a, on a tidal flood model, except maybe NOAA. Um, and, and that's why it is so important to get these maps accurate, because people are going to going to be not forced to use them, but they're going to use them because they don't have the resources on their own. And it just doesn't seem linear to me. Let's just leave it at that. Okay, good. We'll have that conversation. I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. And yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, also too, this doesn't in any way obviate, and I think probably encourages communities that want to uh, encourage development or redevelopment in certain areas to, to, maybe do a, a, a study because you're right a single family homeowner might not be able to afford to do a study but the community perhaps perhaps could and so then there could be uh specific to that community there could be flood elevations that are, that are adopted so there, there's a lot of room for that um and just to kind of facilitate because i know we're, we're we're pretty far behind in the schedule but i think we'll catch up um fluvial flood hazard areas so we talked about title so, you know, there is a number of there are a number of studies out there that show, as I mentioned before, that warmer, a warmer atmosphere means more, more ability for the atmosphere to hold water, which means more intense rain events, which means more frequent rain events. So um, one study concluded that precipitation intensities in New Jersey can be expected to increase by as much as 35 percent by 2100, assuming moderate emission levels. And I think it's important to note that NOAA's current 500 year or 0.2% um, storm is roughly 38% more precipitation than today's 100 year or 1% storm. Um, now, I know there's not a direct correlation between the storm and the flood, so you can't say that um, it's automatically the same. But I do think, again, for the purposes of mapping, that, that um, today's 500 year flood limits as mapped by FEMA is a good approximation of what the 100 year flood or the 1% flood may be in 2100. Um, and the study was was performed uh, by Cornell University 
and, and include uh, a number of data points in New Jersey as well. I think there were 11 gauges in New Jersey that were included as, as part of that model. So this is a map of Lambertville. And so the, the blue line on the edge, on the edge, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the blue line on the edge is the 100 year flood. Then this dashed black and white line is our current design flood. And the solid black line is the 500 year flood. So what this plays out to is that you have two options. The first option is to use, use mapping and the option two is to calculate it. So option one would be to say, we'll take FEMA's 500 year 2.2% flood elevation, add a foot to it, and that becomes your climate adjusted flood elevation. You compare that to what's on the design flood, uh, the flood hazard area design flood elevation on this department delineations, add two feet to that, or the FEMA 1% or the base flood elevation at three. So you would take the highest of those three. And what that ensures is you know, not every water has a delineation of, of the 100 year and the 500 year. Not every water has a state delineation. So this also makes sure that the there's three foot of freeboard on top of FEMA's 1% flood elevation. And that's three, three feet is a good number to be at for, um, for flood insurance purposes. We have a comment from Sandy Blick. Sandy Blick. Hey, Vinny. So can you please speak to what do you mean about the future 100-year discharge? So you've talked about the future elevation. You've talked about additional intensities and 125%, which is what the current flood hazard area design flood is based on. But this future 100-year discharge, how would you determine that? So, so what we would do is, and of course, the science um, and the data available is always improving, right? So we would we would look to um, climate change models to say what the precipitation increase should be. So, like the study that I just referenced in Cornell um, said, thirty to thirty-five percent is is what is expected in New Jersey. So, so what we would do is we would say, well, you could use that that thirty-five uh, percent additional precipitation and then model that watershed to find out what the what the actual flow rate would be and then you'd add 25 percent to it and then model it just like today so it would be taking into account the extra water that would be present because of climate change okay we have uh scott minnick hey scott <laughs> hey vince scott minnick duber again uh and, and, and on the same realm uh that sandy hit on is are, are we going to be modifying the the NOAA atlas for precipitation for projected future rainfall events and you're going to hold us to 2100 21 20 2050 20, or whatever so you're going to give that guidance or you also be modifying the the hydrographs um uh, or the um the delmarva uh distributions the idf curves and everything else because i know they're projected to change as well and I'm not sure that is captured in the, the Cornell study. Right, that's a good point. Um, so, so you know, as far as like the shape of the unit hydrograph, um, you know, we're we're not we're not planning to affect that. It would it would be it would be the volume of precipitation or the or the intensity of precipitation that would change. And and so that would apply equally. Like if an area is. Um, if an area in the Delmarva Del Peninsula is, um, or the Delmarva area of New Jersey, in the coastal plain exhibits those conditions, and there's a, a reasonable likelihood that it's going to stay that way in the future, then you would use Del Delmarva plus the same, you know, the same amount of increase. I think that answered your question, but I recognize that Cornell's study didn't focus on that. Right. That's my my question was just so that. You know, from a planning standpoint, you know, from uh, you know a township or, or a municipality or, or a state agency, that they would know kind of if they were looking into modeling of in and of themselves, what standards would they hold would have to mm -hmm. you know incorporate into their their policies and manuals, um, and, and even the, on the dam safety front, where we're talking about the PMP events and the PMF events, they're actually seeing decreases in volumes. Due to mm -hmm. climate change so i know there was a study in pennsylvania that showed that yes, I, I, exactly I, right yeah yep yeah um so as long as we're you know we're not taking 
you know, looking at something and taking too much and that we're incorporating all the latest data and, and trying to get, get the right answer versus the most uh, conservative answer. Agreed. Agreed. And thank you for that. Um, and, and I would just ask you, um, and my staff that's on the, on the call, if, uh, if you have access to the, um, the link to that um, Cornell study, if you could place it in the chat, that would be great. If it's, if it's just a document that needs to be sent, then, then if you're interested in it, you can contact us and we'll get you uh, access to that. Sure thing, Vince. Thank you. All right, I think I skipped over this. So, so oh boy, there's so much to cover and we're, we only have 45 minutes left. So, um, so I appreciate your patience. And again, I don't want to gloss over anything at the end, but I knew everything was kind of up front here. It was where we'd have our main conversations. So this just speaks to how we would calculate flood hazard areas. Um, I spoke a little bit about Delmarva. Um, and, you know, one, one of the things that we, what we've gotten ourselves into is folks will come to us if they, so, so since our, our mapping methods in some cases rely on FEMA mapping, and if people have a good argument as to why that FEMA mapping they think is you know less less accurate than it should be, then we've provided a method in the rules for people to give us new calculations. And so we would still continue to do that, but but FEMA has a process for amending effective maps. And so if someone has has uh, takes exception to an effective map, whether it's the flowway line or the flood elevation, then there's a process. And so we would ask folks to go to FEMA and get the appropriate map change document that is required. Um, now, if there's there's no standard, let's say if it's a preliminary map and 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 it's passed outside the um, uh, the the comment period for that map, then there might not be a means on the federal level to challenge that map until it becomes effective. And so we would then welcome calculations in those cases to show us what the best data is on that site. And as long as we don't conclude with a flood elevation or a floodway limit that's less less conservative or protective than the FEMA, FEMA minimum as adopted in that community's floodplain ordinance, then that would be fine. But that would be our base. We we wouldn't adopt, we wouldn't verify or adopt a floodplain that's less stringent than the minimum NFIP standard for that community. Flood storage displacement, net fill calcs. Um, right now, there's two slices, right? We have people look between the ground and the 10-year and then the 10 and the design flood. Um, but if if we're causing, if we're saying that we have this climate-adjusted flood elevation that's going to be much higher, at least two feet higher than the design flood, then we think that having three slices is appropriate. So uh, the 10-year elevation or the 10% flood, uh, then the slice between the 10% and the 1%, and then between the 1% 100 year elevation and, and the climate adjusted flood elevation. All right. Just going to keep working along here. And if anybody has a question, you can you can feel free to uh, talk about talk to us. So so we've been working with FEMA to to ensure that we better align our rules with minimum NFIP standards. And there have been some places where FEMA has pointed out to us that um, that we might not be as as protective as the minimum NFIP standard. So there are a number of changes that we anticipate making throughout the rule. Um, you know, the easy thing is to say is to have a statement in, in the rules that we will not issue a permit for something that is less stringent than the minimum NFIP standard for the community. Um, but that plays out in a number of different ways. It, we talked about how that plays out with mapping, but it also relates to the the time in which a permit is valid. So my understanding is that um, in the special flood hazard area, if a community issues a permit as part of their floodplain ordinance, the permit work has to commence within 180 days of approval or else it expires. So we're thinking that what we could do is rather than have that rubric, because then that would that would be very cumbersome to reinstate it, or to, to get a new permit, let's say if it expired, is to have a system in place where, and we'll talk about this later, but where when you get a permit, you would go online and, and register very, very easy and quick. You would register your file number and say, we're gonna start work. And if, if 
we haven't heard from you within 180 days after approval, then an email will go out and say, you're in the flood hazard area. Um, your work, you cannot, you, you haven't commenced work, so you can't, you can't commence it until we, we have a conversation about this. And, and you go through some steps to reinstate it. And what that looks like largely is what happens if the flood maps have changed, right? We issue a permit and no work is done for three years. And now there's a completely new flood map. Um, we don't feel that it's protective of public safety just to rely on a flood map from three years ago because that what's happened to be in place when the permit was issued. Again, we recognize that once work starts, that's different. Or if a substantial um, investment has been made, then there's an opportunity there. We can we can have that conversation. But um, we think that this is an important step to make sure that that the best available flood mapping is used across the board for for development as we go forward. All right. Wow, we're all the way on theme two. It only took us an hour and a half, 20 minutes to get to theme two. But these are shorter. There are fewer slides here. Um, so we can we can go through some of these more quickly. So as we spoke of in the past in prior stakeholder meetings, protecting critical facilities and infrastructure is clearly one of the main objectives of this rule. Um, so by working with Office of Emergency Management, having good definitions, relying on the um, ASCE uh, uh, flood Class, design class and other things, um, we we feel that we can help critical facilities and infrastructure be more resilient. Um, and so what, what does that look like? For buildings, what are the elevation standards? So across the board, whether it's a residential or a critical building, so that would be a hospital, police station, um, it also could be a something where there's multi-residence, uh, you know, like a nursing home, things along, along those uh, points. So those would all have to be elevated a foot. And if it's uh, elevated to a foot above the climate adjusted flood elevation, if it's another building, then you have the option to flood proof to that same elevation. And then dry access plays out the same way as it does today, except that you have deeper flood elevations to manage. Hey Vince, we had um, two people with their hands up. Um, they posted their questions in the chat. So we had um, Sandy Blick asked if for the fluvial analysis, are you saying that the new fluvial storm event is 135% of the existing precipitation plus 125% for the FHADF, which is 168% of existing precipitation? Yes. It would be, you would, you would project the future 100 year flow rate, right, based on that 35% increase. And then on top of that, you would add 25% to the discharge and come up with your 125% flow. And then Mary um, Goldman had a question. Would the FEMA mapping revision be required before FHA permits are filed or as a condition of approval? Hey, Mary, that's a good question. Um, so what we're envisioning is that is that since the permit is based on FEMA mapping, that if that if we would wait till FEMA decides whether or not the mapping challenge is appropriate for that site. So it would not likely be conditional. It would have to be go to FEMA first, work it out with them, and then and then you can then you could get the permit. There's no reason why it couldn't be concurrent. You could apply for a permit. Uh, we just wouldn't be able to issue it likely until FEMA made their determination. All right, elevation standards for roads, really similar to today. Um, you know, the 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 main focus of the rule is elevate roads as much as you can and so whether it's under two feet of water or 10 feet of water you can only raise the road to the extent that you can um so so where although the target is higher um and if it's let's say designated evacuation route um we would want to see you know based on the use of the structure we want to make sure that it's as safe as possible for the people that are relying on it um but other roads, it's it's as much elevated as close to that target elevation as practicable. Even raising a road six or twelve inches might gain us another twenty years. All right. So another hallmark of this rulemaking is increased protection of land and water resources. So we spell out of some of the things that we would do in the CZM rules, the flood hazard rules, and the wetlands rules. 
Um, so these are relatively self uh, self evident changes, self explanatory. Um, so again, pause. Please pause me if you have a comment or concern. I'm just going to co kind of work through the rest of the slides. Uh, the flood hazard rule, um, you know, additions to the 150 foot repairing zone, um, adjusting our our mitigation requirements. Requiring an individual permit for horizontal directional drilling um, under a regulated feature. Uh, Steve Dalton has a comment. Hey, Steve. Hey, Vince. Yeah, I know you're running through these quick to, to catch up a bit um, and, and, and aren't really going into the specifics, but it just seems it, it's a little harder to um, view these intuitively as to how they relate to, to climate change and it's not clear from at least from the you know at least from the spread the um, PowerPoint whether you're talking about these changes in isolated areas like the IRZ or if you're not and instead are talking about these types of uh, changes more broadly so so these changes so the changes on these slides here are more, more broad and and would not be limited just to the inundation risk zone. So for the the purpose of say flood hazard it would be this expanded floodplain and the repairing zone um, is where it would apply. And this you know anytime we open up the regulations, you know we have we have years of experience of of, of using them and we've identified areas where um, where there are gaps in our protection. And that, that it can be improved, right? So, for example, um, up in the for, just for the first bullet point as an example, there are features up in, say, the Highlands area um, or nearby that have have limestone deposits, karst topography. And so you have you'll have a robust stream that drains less than 50 acres, and it has a discernible bend and bank, and it might even have a benthic community, and then it disappears into a sinkhole. And then 300 feet away or 200 feet or 500 feet away, it pops up again and goes into a category one water. So our current rules don't don't afford us, don't afford that feature protections. It doesn't put a repairing zone around it because it's isolated. So it's it's adjusting the definitions and um, the focus of the of the rules so that it gets to the to the core of what we have always intended it to be. And that's that's what would, would fall under these categories. Dan Kennedy. Hey, Dan. Hey, Vin. Um, I've got a question about the uh, horizontal directional drilling. Um, this seems to have very little to do with climate change or risks from it. Um, and it's really curious that this is on here because we recently testified on the science to the science advisory board um, where the commissioner has submitted questions to the SAB. And it looks like the land use program has presumed to answer them already that there are risks from uh, HDD that need an individual permit. So um, I guess I'm disappointed in that um, and makes the SAB process look like a little bit like a joke. So um, a little note there. And um, we hope that the SAB process is not a joke and that the testimony that stakeholders are providing to that group, which, um, you know, don't land in the same conclusion that you've landed on here. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Well, no, Dan, your, your points are well taken. I mean, first of all, obviously, we, we there, there's two pieces of this, right? There's there's whether or not horizontal directional drilling is something that we regulate at all, because right now under the wetlands rules, if you're directional drilling under a wetland, you don't need any permit. And if you're directional drilling under a stream, you don't need any permit. Um, so there's, there's the jurisdictional, like, is it appropriate for the department to exert authority over this type of activity that's going under a regulated area. And then the second part is what standards to apply. So as far as like what kind of like testing protocols or, you know, um, number of soil borings or all, all that, that we would definitely wait to see what the SAB comes up with because um, clearly we don't want to jump the gun on it. But what this is speaking to is simply that based on our experience and the fact that there are in inadvertent discharges of, of of material that we've seen happen repeatedly that we feel that this is not the kind of thing we should exempt from our rules so we're saying we we want someone to come in for a permit and and then and then in the 
hopefully down the road we'll have some standards then after the SAP makes its determinations and um, and then we can include those standards. Yeah, I appreciate those comments, but an individual permit is the most aggressive way you could approach this. So we'd ask you before you put pen to paper on this to really uh, engage with stakeholders on this aspect and um, an individual permit is probably, in our view, not the way to go. Understood. Understood. We contemplated maybe making a general permit for this. Um, there's in under flood hazard. There's not effectively much difference between a GP and an IP. It's not like a wetlands IP where, where, where there's mitigation requirements and whatnot. But but your point's taken, and we can certainly continue to have that conversation. Okay, uh, Mike Gross. Hey, Mike. I have, so I, have, I have two questions. One is under the CZM rules, which you passed by very quickly. Ah, I'll um, go back for you. The traffic rules. Any permitted development meets traffic level D. Does that mean if the existing level of service is below D, you've got to improve it to be D? Because that's not the rule now. That's what this is speaking to. So if you're on a state highway and the level of service is F and the state highway, the DOT doesn't want to make those improvements, you're stuck. Well, that's different, right? So so that's that's where the devil's in the details of this right because because if if um well there's there's a few pieces to this right so you could have an intersection and it's it's at f and maybe you can improve that intersection to to a higher level but the overall road system you can't because it's just outside the scope of it so this is where this is where we have to sit down and figure out exactly how this would play out in a variety of, of conditions but the goal is to say where it's possible let's elevate the let's le elevate the traffic level d and and my second question is uh, following up on dan's uh the the horizontal directional drilling you would think you would want to encourage that and you know one size does not fit all a, 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 a line to connect a solar facility to a point of interconnection is probably not going to have any contaminants to release and neither will a water, you know, a water line from a from a water source. Um, sewer may be different, so I don't think one size fits all in, in 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 that circumstance. And that's a good point, and that came up yesterday when we were talking to some of our interagency folks about about some of these things. And you know, the 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 idea came up about what about directional drilling for fiber optic cables along a highway or something, right? So so there there's there there are nuances here, right? And it's interesting that the discharge is not related to what's inside the pipe. It's it's the discharge in our experience has been related to the the placement, the placement of the pipe, right? It's the actual methodology of 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 directional drilling that in certain geological formations can can cause, you know, depending on what pressure is used and whatnot, it can cause inadvertent releases. Uh, of the of like the the drilling material, not what's in the pipe. So it it, it gets to the method of placement. And you're right. We certainly would um, if a, if a, if a if a pipe needs to go under a stream or a wetland, I would much prefer that it's directionally drilled than than an open trench construction, which is what you know when I first started working at DEP, that's all we saw, and we thought this was a good move um, to go to directional drilling. And we still think it is, but but we want to make sure that there's appropriate protections in place. Uh, Vince, we have three hands up. Uh, do you want to take those questions or do you want to keep moving? And uh, Boy, I would really like to, to, to hear everybody's thoughts and comments. Um, I'll tell you what, let's let's very quickly do those three and then I and then I think we're going to have to need to hold um, most of the comments to the end because we're we're running low on time. And, and one thing I should point out to uh, Mike and Dan is that, um, you know, we can we can have another round of discussions on this in, in January to, to figure out what to come together and, and decide what makes sense for regulating HDD. Okay, uh, Tom Gilbert. Hi, Tom. Yeah, hi, Vince. Um, I just want to uh, comment on this HDD issue um, and just remind everyone that um, HDD is not a panacea and we only need to look at the uh, recent spills that occurred during construction of the SR, SRL pipeline as a reminder of that. And that's not the only example. There have been many significant spills that have occurred um, as a result of HDD, especially during pipeline construction around the country. So we think it's totally appropriate that you've uh, proposed that um, individual permits be required uh, for HDD under 
flood hazard. It was the it was um, uh, those general permits on SRL uh, that that you know really I think resulted in in, in the problems in the first place. Um, although we would, uh, in terms of the treatment of HDD under freshwater wetlands rules, we see that you're proposing general permits there, and uh, wonder about the the sort of difference in approach between flood hazard and freshwater wetlands. Um, I know you. Uh, you referenced some conditions there. Um, obviously, we need to, you know, you know, more, need more discussion about what, you know, kind of what those thresholds would be. Um, but uh, we certainly would want to be a part of any follow-up discussions to uh, to follow up on what makes sense to deal with HDD. And lastly, would just make the, the the point that we know that climate change is having, you know, impacts um, in addition to sea level rise. And the impacts of climate change are not limited to, uh, you know, flooding in those inundation areas. And climate change is stressing water resources and, and, and natural resources throughout the state in various ways. So we think it's, uh, you know, appropriate that this be included here, and that, uh, you know, you take take steps to address the uh, very uh, evident, you know, risks of HDD construction, and want to be a part of uh, figuring that out. Thank you for that. And yes, this is this is a conversation that we this and all the things that we spoke on of today are, are conversations that we need to continue into January because um, we don't want to make our we don't want to spend our efforts on a rulemaking that misses the mark. Right. And that's why we're having these conversations. So thank you for that. Um, just very quickly, the other two folks, um, Lauren, that you they identified and then we should move on. OK, uh, Valerie Rabel. Hey, Vince. Hey. Um, just, to, just to clarify, right now a GP10 for replacement in kind, basically the length and the hydraulic opening, if there's fragmentation, we don't have to comply with that. But you're saying under these new rules, we would no longer be able to get a GP10. It would be an IP. Yes. So we're making a distinction between where there's repair versus where there's replacement. And our, our feeling is that if there's existing habitat fragmentation, and the the transportation authority having authority of the of their the bridge or culvert is making a substantial investment of funds to, for a structure that's going to be there for hopefully 75 years then this is an opportunity to provide to kind of fix the 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 sins of the past as it were right because the fragmentation exists because the road is there in the first place um does that mean that every ro road crossing is going to be able to accommodate this no there, there are hydraulic considerations, as you know, right? So, sure. um, so, but, but it, um, it, it was, you know, we we had taken a step to kind of facilitating putting back in the past rulemakings to, well, like, yeah, if you keep what you have, it's good enough. But we're seeing now with, um, you know, with the changing with the changing climate and the changing habitat areas. And you know the different pressures that are on different uh, species. There's, they're just it's so there's so much interplay between all of these things, access to the water and whatnot. That we we feel that any time that something's being replaced, uh, or you know, especially a bridge or a culvert, that there's an opportunity for us to at least find out if there's a way to make it better. So yeah, so that would be the the GP10 wouldn't be available then in, in cases like that. Thanks, Ray Cantor. Hey, Ray. Hey, for the uh, Ray Cantor NJBIA. I want to make sure, um, I, I think this is going back to the beginning. I just want to make sure that's how it plays out. And it's specifically about the climate impact assessments or whatever the, the phraseology was. I think when you said, you said they were only going to apply to the inundation zone and a recognition of risk. Are you requiring at all any climate impact assessments for um, all these other projects um even outside the inundation zone and in particular are you looking for uh an applicant to assess um the impact on the climate from that project as opposed to recognition that it may be vulnerable to additional flooding how far is that impact assessment going okay so that's that's a great question and there's a lot of a lot of pieces to that so i'm going to give you the kind of the, the shorthand answer but then i want to continue the conversation in in january um so so just so our, our main our main thrust is to make sure that the standards here are commensurate with the level of risk. So if you're in an inundation risk zone 
or you're outside the inundation risk zone, but you're doing, uh, you're constructing a, a critical facility or critical infrastructure, then then that's would be the 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 higher level of of investigation as far as like what you know what what can be done to avoid and minimize and ameliorate the impacts uh, on cl of climate change on what you're doing right and 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 to the extent of what you're doing, how it serves the overall community. So if I'm building a hospital and it's in and it's in an area that we've identified as being in a floodplain in the future and no one can get to it or from it, that's a problem. So that would be more of an analysis of there's is there any other place in this community where this hospital can be built that would serve the needs of the community and so on. Um, if 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 you're doing something outside the IRZ and it's not a critical building or critical infrastructure, it's a much less it's a it's a lesser bar that you have to meet. So you're building a Wawa in you know in an area that is a current floodplain or a future floodplain. So there there could be maybe a checklist of of things like say, you know have you considered these things or um, you know so it would not be an analysis. It would be more of a statement. It would be a narrative. Um, and so um, our focus would be on those on those thing those facilities and infrastructure that it's are most at risk and also things within the IRZ. But you're not going to ask that a hospital to analyze how many cars will be happening or are occurring at its facility, what the carbon emissions would be and ways to reduce it. You're not looking for a mitigation analysis or, not, or an additional impact analysis from any of the projects. Not not in this in this round of rulemaking, no. Okay. Thank you. All right, freshwater wetlands rules. Um, adding more comprehensive cumulative mitigation requirements, the kind of adjusting the transition area. Uh, you know, some some cases minor, some cases uh, more impactful. So, any comments on on these two two slides? All right, let's let's talk briefly about stormwater. Um, so the first the first bullet point on site retention, we've discussed that in prior stakeholder meetings on the stakeholder rules. Um, and the last bullet bullet I've already spoken to, that's we have this interesting dilemma in the storm in the wetlands rules where where the way it's structured in the rule, we we can't where 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 if it's a flood hazard or a coastal permit and any portion of the project needs a permit from us and the project is a major development then we look at stormwater but wetlands is not like that it says the wetlands the activity under the general permit has to be a major development and so the wetlands rules don't often trigger the stormwater management rules um, so there's no reason to have it different than flood hazard and coastal and so we would be making that change but the the middle one is one that uh, we've talked about here and there, but I want to make it really clear what we're saying here. Um, I, in my three plus decades at DEP, I've seen a number of cases where there's a large, say, industrial complex, and it's being ripped up and and uh, you know maybe cleaned up, and then development's put back, and the development that's being put back is less impervious surface than what's there now. So that's great for quantity. And that's great for recharge because you're probably reducing the quantity and you're increasing the recharge a bit. Um, but there's no requirement to provide water quality treatment to the redeveloped area. So whereas now, um, in order to trigger water, trigger water quality requirements in the rule, you would need to have a quarter acre of additional impervious surface. What this is saying is that it's not just additional impervious surface, it's also if you're reconstructing um, I, I should say motor vehicle surface. If you're constructing new or reconstructing a quarter acre of motor vehicle surface, then the portion of the project that you're either building or or reconstructing will be required to meet the same 80% TSS removal rate as if it were new. Now we recognize that given uh, communities um, and the infrastructure and communities that this might not always be achievable, but we're we're not in a place that we can continue just to allow um 
with without without a conversation or an investigation allow water quality impairment to continue, especially as this relates mostly to EJ issues as well. So any thoughts on on this and challenges that you foresee? Andrew? I don't have a last name. Just Hi. Says Hi. Uh, this is Andrew Tavis from New Jersey Future. Um, I wanted to ask a question about stormwater, which is um, what is the timing for uh, these phase two rules and um, how does that correspond with the March 2nd deadline for municipalities to rewrite their ordinances? Thank you. Sure. So. So this is this is a new this is a new rulemaking that would be commensurate with or kind of on the same track as as the the changes to the flood hazard coastal and and the wetlands rules right. So our thought is to propose in the spring and to have adopted hopefully by the end of the year. Right, and it's unrelated to the requirements for municipalities to currently modify their ordinances because of the changes we already adopted earlier this year. Got it. Thanks. And is that is that timing the same for the for the CZM, FWW, and FHA? I'm sorry, I kind of lost you there for a second. Right. Is, is, is that timing the same for coastal zone management, freshwater wetlands, and flood hazard, like adopt in spring and? Um, I'm sorry, proposed in spring and adopted at the end of the year? Correct. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, and thanks, Gabe, for, for uh, clarifying that. Jennifer Coffey. Hey, Jen. Great, thank you. Hi, Vince, can you hear me? I can. Wonderful. I just wanted to say, uh, Jennifer Coffey, Executive Director of ANJAC, the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions, we are very much in support of these revisions to the stormwater management rules. We think this is a game changer. When the stormwater rules came out in 2004, effective 2005, they were really designed to keep things from getting worse. And so we've seen that that has been effective in some areas and less effective in others when you start to look at the integrated report and water quality data. But given, as you said, where we are with development and having well more than 95% of our streams impaired for at least one parameter of surface water quality standards, it's well about time that we start looking at addressing runoff from development and redevelopment that predates those 2004 rules. As one of the 13 original colonies, New Jersey has an awful lot of legacy development, and that is just simply something that we need to approach if we're going to fulfill our mission of the Clean Water Act and providing clean water. So we think this is great. We're very supportive and looking forward to working with you and municipalities on implementing it. Thank you, John. Uh, one more before we move on, because um, we're getting close to the end here. Mike Pissarro. Hey, Mike. Hey, Vinny. This is Mike Pissarro, from Policy Director of the Watershed Institute. Uh, just second what Jennifer just said on the stormwater rules, uh, but also wanted to sort of plug out there, you know, given the climate change report, you know, suggests that pollution levels in our streams are going to increase because of increased storm intensity, increased runoff. I think not only the stormwater rules, but our flood hazard, our wetlands, our coastal zone should also incorporate in its permitting decisions that water quality data. So if we're going to permit an, an incursion to, into the riparian zone or the transition area, what is the impacts of increased pollution into those waterways, into that water body, that wetland? Uh, and you know, how do we manage stormwater that's already going to an impaired waterway when that increase of pollution is going to happen. So I think we should really integrate water quality st standards as into that permitting decision. So I appreciate that, the time to plug that. Thank you, Mike, I appreciate that. I, I want, do want to point out that it's, um, let's see what time is it, it's 2.49. So that means we have 11 minutes left. Um, so clearly we're not gonna be able to give the rest of the slides the treatment that they deserve. Um, so. I'm going to suggest that we con we continue on. We end at three because I want to be respectful of everyone's time, and then we can reconvene in January and ad adjust the agenda to focus on some of the issues that have been raised so far to this 
on the slides that we've already covered and then to kind of pick up where we left off and uh, continue the conversation from there. Great idea, Vinny. Thanks. All right, so planning for climate change. Um, this is, is basically just one slide and it deals specifically with um, changes to the CZM rules uh, regarding the minimum criteria for determining consistency of a state planning commission approved core center core node. So this gets into the CAFRA requirements um, and in Appendix H of the CZM rules, there's department delineated coastal centers that would be deleted. So basically we would be relying on the state plan commissions, uh, basically their designation. So any thoughts on this? Okay, we have um, a few people's hands. We have four hands up, Vince. Uh, okay. Sandy Blick. Sandy Blick. Actually, I just had a couple of general questions. You had mentioned comments in a January meeting with uh, an adoption, a proposal in in spring. When would you need comments? And my second comment is with respect to something you had earlier. Uh, so if a utility disturbs motor vehicle surface on a roadway, they would then be required uh, if they disturb a quarter acre to put in a water quality BMP or address that, right? That's how I just want to make sure I miss. That's what you meant by the the uh, slide a couple slides ago. Thank yes. you. Yes, yes. So if you're if if someone is in, is is contemplating reconstructing a quarter acre or more of motor vehicle surface, then it would trigger the water quality requirements, right? And as as far as the timing, if if you have comments to offer sooner than later, offer them as soon as you can. Um, there's obviously we'll try to schedule this the the next step in the conversation as early in January as we can. And then we would just ask that the comments be submitted shortly thereafter because, you know, we we um, we want to keep moving on this rulemaking. Ray Cantor. Hey, Ray. Ray, you might be muted. I can't I can't hear you. Sorry, Ebony. Ray Cantor, NJBIA. Uh, the whole issue of coastal centers is going back 20 years now. Uh, we seem to be going, you know, all over the place on this. And, and the reason why the department initially designated coastal centers, and I and I admit it, it's not an ideal scenario, was because the state planning commission uh, was not able to um, designate centers in any timely fashion. Uh, is the state planning commission now changing its processes? Uh, uh, Actions, you know, what gives you the department confidence that, you know, for the first time now in 30 years, they're going to be able to act with any uh, speed to um, take these type of actions. We've, I understand what you're saying. We've, we've been working closely with the State Planning Commission and, um, and I feel confident that, that, that this is not the same issue that we wrestled with 20, 30 years ago. Um, the other thing I want to point out too is that is you know it, it kind of it's kind of the same with the FEMA flood mapping too, where people um, would come to us because the other systems out there weren't weren't doing it on, on the same time frame as the as they wanted, right? So it kind of puts the department in a in a strange position where we're interpreting other people's decisions or kind of doing you know overlapping with them, right? We've had this with DCA. Um, and so, you know, we respect the state planning commission, and we've been we've been reengaged with them, and working with them with many municipalities in the in the plan endorsement process. So, so going forward, I, I feel optimistic that the the trials and tribulations of the past won't be revisited. Um, but certainly open to more conversation about this, and would love to hear your your thoughts and your history with this. Okay, uh, one more comment, uh, Jennifer Coffey. Hey, well, hi, Vince. It's 2020 and things just got really weird because I think Ray Cantor and I are in the same boat on this one. Uh, <laughs> given that the state plan, if I'm not misremembering, goes back to predating Superstorm Sandy and the um, inconsistencies, I'll say, around the state plan both their designations, their meetings, the appointments. 
I, I mean, I, I like the idea in theory and the, the streamlining of planning, but I have some concerns about the implementation. So I, I trust your reassurances, but I hope that we can also talk about it a little bit more in the future because I've, I've got concerns about there being um, some disjointed connections there for, for climate change planning. I, I can appreciate that and, and thank you for that. And so let's let's definitely have that conversation, all of us. Great, thanks. Cool. All right. Um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something here. I'm gonna take the five minutes left that we have and and let's 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 take six, seven, and eight and we'll we'll reconvene on these in um, in January. So I apologize. I didn't want to run out of time, but I also wanted to make sure that we had at least a good opportunity to talk about the main main issues. So let's just take the remaining five minutes and see anybody has any comments or questions sir, from the first five bullet points. Uh, Joe Scoopian has his hand up. Yeah, hi Vinny. Thank, thank you again. Vince, I just want to get a, a understanding and I, I'm not for or against, I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned about the technical basis of what's being proposed, particularly for the flooding, the flood levels. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, I did not hear a lot of technical support for some of the proposals. Are you saying in this timeline that the department is looking at making a proposal, making this a, a formal proposal by March? Our plan is is to make a formal proposal in the spring. Okay, and, spring. That's and, what I meant. Sorry. Right, and and so, can you give me an example of what you mean specifically, like well, that? For instance, the, the well, my the, the simple arithmetic of adding five feet to the hundred year flood. I I didn't hear anything other than you're going to look more into that. Um, I heard about one rainfall study to adjust hundred year rainfalls, um, and again, I'm not. I'm, I'm not trying to take a position for or against. I'm just trying to make sure that what you're proposing um, is technically sound, it, that you're, the application of it is technically sound. You're talking about a risk of flooding, particularly tidally, that has a 17% chance of happening. And you say, well, 50% chance of happening, 50% not happening. Well, you can do the same arithmetic with 17%. And so mm -hmm. I'm actually, this all sounds great to me, but I don't want you folks to go into a proposal. And you and all, Vinny, you, you and I have worked a long time. You know the difference between a proposed rule and a final rule. Um, you could, yeah, you could have a hard time slipping a piece of paper between the two. So we're talking <laughs> about spring resolving what I think are a lot of technical questions here. So I just want to make sure that, not being critical again, just want to make sure that that's what your intent is. So our intent is to propose rules that are based on the best available science and to explain how we got to, in a more detailed manner, how we got to the elevations and the and the processes that we have. So, you know, the, 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 the difficult the difficulty in this forum is that it's you know any any mm. one of these slides we could spend the whole two hours talking about that one yeah, slide absolutely. and deservedly so absolutely. and that's you know because there are so many pieces that that interrelate and and mm -hmm. uh so so but yeah absolutely one of the things you know we we can't propose a rule unless we explain why right so if if we're proposing the changes you know you've seen a number of rulemaking efforts um mm. over the years more than you probably want to admit right um there, there's a robust public discussion about what we perceive to be the issue that we're addressing, why we've chosen the route that we've chosen, what the impacts will be of that of that choice, what the underlying science is of it, and and we have done a lot of research on this. Got it's it. just that I just can't provide it in this no, form. That, because, that's fine. I don't want to take anybody else's time. I just find that at the time of rulemaking proposal, the technical issues get lost in non-technical uh, baggage. How's that? I'll, I'll be quiet. Thanks. All right, Vince, you want to take, we have one more hand up. Uh, Scott yeah. Minutes. Sounds good. Hey, Scott. 
I was just kind of reiterating uh, what Joe was saying is if there is certain amount of ongoing research that could potentially answer some of these questions, especially with the projection of the flooding. Um, that maybe if people have those studies or have people from those studies that they should bring them to the table in January and, you know, at least give you some insight on what's going on, how it's going on. Um, I know Rutgers had done um, like a stakeholders when it came to the flood mapper and the fluvial flooding using the hand method for uh, uh, interpretation of the fluvial data, which is not, it's kind of a more rudimentary method, but that was one of the big things that came out of that meeting was the projection of the flood elevation inland, that that's not necessarily the model you want to be using. And there are ongoing studies for that. And if they coincide with the rulemaking, maybe it's uh, either making allowances for that in the rulemaking or maybe holding off until those studies are actually completed. Um, but just a thought that, you know, maybe having uh, an interdisciplinary uh, expert panel uh, may help you, which me, you already have done, but answer some of these questions that are being brought up by Joe and some of the other people on, the, on this uh, call. So just my thoughts. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Well, um, obviously, there's a lot that we didn't cover. We didn't get to offshore wind. We didn't get to um, nature based solutions. We didn't get to some of our on, online registration processes that we wanted to talk about. Um, again, it's try, it's difficult finding the balance between spending enough time on any one topic and making sure that all voices are heard. So um, so a few takeaways is, first of all and foremost, thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation. I know with the holiday season, it's difficult to carve out two hours. Um, and we, I know we've had a number of these stakeholder meetings, but I hope that what that communicates is our willingness to listen and, and, our, and our commitment to doing what's right for the people of New Jersey. Um, and having a, a balanced approach to to what we are expecting people because we don't want to adopt rules that are unachievable or or look like they're achieving something but aren't able to get there. So um, this is all extremely helpful and important to us and I appreciate very much your your willingness to participate. And what we'll do is we'll reconvene in January. Um, we'll we'll contemplate internally like the best way to do that, whether it should be one big meeting or if we should break it off into separate topics um, that we can focus in on. And uh, in the meantime, I hope you all have a very happy, safe, blessed holiday season. And I thank you for participating. Well done, Benny. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thanks, Benny. Thanks, Benny. Thanks, Benny. Thanks, Benny.